Very good to see you all here. We begin with the thought that we have studied a couple of weeks ago that there's something worse than being financially destitute. There is something worse than being afflicted with a great physical ailment. There's something worse, the Bible says, than death. And that something worse is losing your soul in the devil's hell. In Revelation chapter 21, Revelation 21, as John is seeing the vision, he makes this note here. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burns or lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And when we read that list, I think we easily see, yes, the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, the idolaters, yes, those people are going to go to hell. But did you notice the very first thing that he listed there? It says that the cowardly are going to lose their souls in that lake of fire. So we want to be people who are not cowardly, but we have faith. We're brave. We're strong. In John chapter 6, 47, and many other places, the Lord talks about the fact that our faith will lead to eternal life. But let's understand when He talks about faith leading to eternal life or everlasting life, that He's talking about a strong faith, a consistent faith. A faith that endures through trials and sufferings and difficulties in life. When we read the Word of God, we have what we need to live by the power of faith. We have what we need here that would instruct us and guide us in knowing the will of God and understanding God's promises and the hope that that gives us as we look forward to receiving those promises. And when we study the Word of God, we see men and women who walked in times past in faith and lived by faith. And when we see their examples, it will encourage and inspire us to live by faith and to help us to see it is possible even in the most difficult circumstances we can imagine. So this morning we want to look at three different examples and draw some lessons from them as we go through them. First of all, let's go back to 2 Kings. 2 Kings. In 2 Kings chapter 18, we're reading here about a time in Israel when you have the divided kingdom. And really at this point that we're going to read, the, the northern kingdom is gone. But the background of what's happening here is the nation of Assyria is the dominant world power. And it is going westward across Asia into the land of Canaan, into the land of Judea. And it has already taken the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity. It's gone. It's done for. They proceeded to invade and to move against Jerusalem because that was the next target that the Assyrians were going after. And what's happening during this time, just prior to that invasion, when Hezekiah came to the throne, he instituted religious reforms. He began to purge the land of idolatry and to restore the law and the practice and the respect and the teaching of the law of God. And as Assyria has now come down and surrounded Jerusalem, they lay siege to Jerusalem. In 2 Kings 18, verse 17, it says, Then the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rab Rabsaris, the Rabshakeh from Lachish with a great army against Jerusalem to King Hezekiah. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. When they had come up, they went and stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool, which was on the highway to the fuller's field. So there they are with a great army 
and beginning to lay siege to the city of Jerusalem. If you continue to read down through that chapter, what you will see is the Assyrians continually hurling insults at the Jews, at the Jewish God, that they don't have a God that can protect them. Because look at all the other gods that could not protect their people as they have marched across different lands, different nations, different societies, and they've conquered them one after the other. And they say, your God's no different. And we're going to take you. And don't be deceived in the fact that we're going to take you and destroy you. Now in 2 Kings chapter 19, I want us to read verses 1 through 7 and see how Isaiah, or rather Hezekiah, is distraught and he appeals to Isaiah for some help. In 2 Kings 19 verse 1, And so it was when King Hezekiah heard it that he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. Then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy. For the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God, and will rebuke the words of the Lord, and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. The first thing that I want us to note there is with Hezekiah being distraught, he covered himself with sackcloth, he goes in before the Lord, he appeals to him. He sends that message. He says this is a day of trouble. This is a day of rebuke. This is a day of blasphemy. The children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. In other words, he says, I see this as a hopeless thing. We're not going to be able to do what needs to be done here. We're, we're, we're stuck. We're in a, we have a problem. And understand that the danger he was facing was not like you had a bunch of rebels that just approached the city and began to boast, empty boast against them. This is the superpower of the world at the time that was known for skinning people alive and hanging their skins around the city on poles and stacking up skulls at the city gates to intimidate their enemies. They were ruthless. They were brutal. And if they got into Jerusalem, if they had to fight for it to get in there, that's exactly what they were going to do to them. And so Hezekiah is distraught. There is a bit of fear in him. And we know there was fear in him because the message back to him from Isaiah, from the Lord, is do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Be strong and have faith. So Hezekiah was distraught. When you read in verse 8 then, 2 Kings 19 verse 8, it says the rapture could return and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he had departed from Lachish. And what that's simply saying is these men came up against them with this great army. They heard these threats. They heard that their king had abandoned where he was and they go to help him. But then they come back. In 2 Kings 19, verse 9, and following on down there, you read about the time that they come back. But I want us to jump to 2 Chronicles in the parallel account. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32. 2 Chronicles chapter 32. And notice when they come back what Hezekiah does. In 2 Chronicles 32, verse 1. After these deeds of faithfulness, that is, it's going through the account of him restoring the religion of Jehovah and purging the land of idolatry. So after these deeds of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered Judah. He encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them over to himself. 
And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that his purpose was to make war against Jerusalem, he consulted with his leaders and commanders to stop the water from the springs which were outside the city, and they helped him. Thus many people gathered together who stopped all the springs and the brook that ran through the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? And he strengthened himself, built up all the wall that was broken, raised it up to the towers, and built another wall outside. Also he repaired the Milo in the city of David and made weapons and shields in abundance. Then he set military captains over the people, gathered them to gather to him in the open square of the city gate, and gave them encouragement, saying, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude which is with him, for they there are more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people were strengthened by the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. So it is that Hezekiah here is expressing great faith and he's encouraging the people. He gets the leaders together and he says, here's one of the actions we're going to take. We're going to go out and stop up the water. So when that army approaches, they're going to have difficulty finding sources of water. So he's cutting off supplies, their ability to survive there. And then also he goes on and he fortifies their defenses. And he builds these weapons. And he encourages the people, telling them to be strong because there's more with us than with him. They have the arm of flesh. They have a mighty army. They have all this great power in this world, but the Lord is with us. And the Lord will fight our battles. So Hezekiah is expressing great faith. You go on down through in 2 Kings 19 when you go back to the other parallel account and you see that they are hurling these insults and threats against Hezekiah and against the people who are there in Jerusalem. They continue to threaten them on down through chapter 19, 2 Kings 19. And then in verse 14, notice what happens. 2 Kings 19, verse 14. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see and hear the words of, of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste to the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord, our God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. You see how he's going before the Lord and appealing for help from him directly? Then Isaiah sends a message to him in 2 Kings 19, verses 20 and following there. And his message is essentially that you can scorn the threats of the Assyrians. You can laugh at them when they say that they are going to come in and conquer you and torture you. You can ignore their blasphemy because they blaspheme the wrong God. And he explains there how don't they understand that I'm the one who made all these things? You've conquered these lands, but I made this land is essentially the message. And so they have no power against God. And he assures them that they are going to be victorious in the end. And when we jump down now to 2 Kings 19, verse 35, notice what happens. It says, And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians one hundred and eighty-five thousand. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. And then it goes on to tell us that Sennacherib and his army packed up and left. And then Sennacherib was killed by his own sons when he was in his idol's temple. So the Lord protected His people. Let's understand that you think about the enemies of God's people. And when you think about Assyria, an idolatrous, humanist, if you will, nation and entity and power, 
And there are secular powers that will attack the people of God, that will attack Christians even today. That ultimately, they are powerless against God. Because God is greater than them. You think about a government that may have power and wealth and influence. Well, who is it that established governments to start with? Who is it that brings governments up and takes them down? Well, it's God. He's greater. He is more powerful. And the enemies of God are going to be defeated. They will be. You think about what Hezekiah did there with his people, how he put his faith into action, going out and stopping up the water sources and fortifying the defenses and making weapons and appealing to God for help. That's a pattern for us. That we take action and we seek God's help in the struggles that we face. Whatever that threat may be coming against us. Understanding that those threats are real threats. They're not idle. They're real. And if some people felt the punishment of that power, yes, some people have felt the punishment. As Assyria marched across the land, as they had already taken Israel into captivity, there were people who felt the power of Assyria and suffered under it. There are people who suffer under the oppression that we see in our society today from the secular powers, the forces that are out there. We see that suffering going on. We see them facing those consequences. Let's understand if we will put our faith in God and take action, God will be with us and God will defeat them. At some point, He will take them down. Let's jump over to the book of Esther now. The book of Esther. When you look at the background of what's happening in the book of Esther, the book opens up with Persia being in power, King Xerxes sitting on the throne. He and his counselors get rid of Queen Vashti. And as time passes by, they move to replace Vashti with another queen. And it so happens that Esther is the one that is chosen and as the story unfolds, it tells us about Esther's cousin, Mordecai, the one who brought her up from youth because she was an orphan. And how that he refused to bow to one of the king's main men, Haman. Haman being an arrogant and selfish man, he wanted everyone to bow down to him, but Mordecai refused to do that. And so Haman deceitfully tricked the king, got the king, to sign a decree that all the Jews were to be destroyed and all their goods plundered at the end of the year. And so that decree has gone out. And in Esther chapter 4, we pick up here in verse 1 and see how Mordecai reacts to that, how he responds to it. In Esther 4, beginning in verse 1 there, it says, When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry, He's completely distraught because what's going to happen at the end of the year is the people have been given permission to go and to attack the Jews and to kill them and to take whatever they have. And he's not sure what to do about it at this point. And he's out there and he's making a scene more or less and it tells us later that Esther then sends her maids and her eunuchs and says, go out there and talk to Mordecai and tell him to change his clothes. And she's trying to calm him down and then also find out what's going on. Why is he acting like this? Well, then notice what happens in verse 7. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hathak returned and told Esther the word, words of Mordecai. So he explains it. Here's what it is. Here's a copy of the decree. You need to go and plead to the king on our behalf. Somehow get this stopped. Well, you jump down to verse 10 then. Notice how Esther reacts to this. 
Then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes in to the inner court to the king, who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these thirty days. So she's saying, I fear being put to death. I haven't been in to see the king for a month. And if I go in, he doesn't want me in there. That means he'll execute me. So she has this fear in her. Well, then Mordecai responds, beginning in verse 13. Mordecai told him to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than the, of all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So his message back to her is kind of a mix of admonition and encouragement. You will not escape. If you remain silent, you don't say anything, don't try to put a stop to this, you will not escape. It's going to fall on you. And who knows whether you've been put here for this very purpose. And so then Esther responds like this, beginning in verse 16, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink three days, night or day, my maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Esther responded at first with fear. She receives that admonition, the encouragement, and she responds with faith. If I perish, I perish. But notice that she requests something of him. You go on down through chapter 5, and you read in there how that the king goes, or the queen goes to the king, and he holds out his scepter. And so she is brought in. Now I want us to think about this. As it unfolds there, Esther is able to reveal things to the king and to work a plan that helps to deliver the Jews. And it's eventually they establish the Feast of Purim and they still celebrate that today because of what's happening here. But think about what's going on in the big picture for a moment. That with Haman's actions, essentially what you have is a culture, a culture that approves of attacking God's people where it's acceptable, where it's permissible. And it's even advantageous to attack those who are faithful to God. You know, before with Hezekiah, you have this secular power that's moving against the people of God. But here in the book of Esther, you have essentially people being told, here's your permission slip, go and attack God's people and take what they have. And we live in a culture where more and more it is acceptable. It's approved. It's praised when somebody attacks a person that's standing up for truth. Esther, we see, is a great example of one who put her faith in action. One lesson we learn from her is that she asked others to pray for her. It says fasting here, just as we read through this book, we don't read about prayer, we don't read about God, but God and prayer are everywhere in this book. And what she's asking them to do is go appeal to God for me because I'm getting ready to go do something that scares me very much because I may be put to death. She had this fear in her of that. And so she is appealing to God for help. She's asking Mordecai and other Jews in the city to appeal to God. Spend three days doing this, and then I'm going to go into the king. 
And so she took action in seeking the help of others and seeking the help of God, but she went into the king alone. Nobody is there with her. She went in by herself. Imagine the courage that it took for this young queen to go in before the king knowing that it could cost her her life. All alone. She's a great example of great faith. And we need to take courage from that. There are times when we have to stand all alone and nobody else is going to be there with us. But we have to determine, are we going to do the right thing? And remember the words of Mordecai to her, who knows if you come to the kingdom for such a time as this. It may be that in God's providence, we are the one that takes a stand we are the one who speaks out. We are the one who takes that action that helps to protect, preserve, defend the people of God, the kingdom of God. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And just make note of our next example in Peter. Peter. You remember how on the night that the Lord observed the Passover with His disciples, the night in which He was betrayed, as He was talking to them about what was going to unfold, Peter boasted about how he was loyal to the Lord and ready to die for the cause and for Christ. And the Lord told him, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And that's exactly what unfolded. That when it came down to that moment of truth, Peter folded because of fear. We studied that last time in the lesson, The Poison of Fear. Peter denied the Lord, whom he loved, because he was afraid of the people who were around him and what would happen to him. So that's in the background of what's going on here. You fast forward into Acts chapter 3. And Peter and John are going up into the temple. There's a lame man there. They heal the lame man. The lame man is leaping and shouting and happy that he has now been healed. And when the crowd gathers around, Peter begins to preach to that crowd. But the Jewish leaders are very angry about that. And so they come into the temple and they arrest Peter and John. Now we pick up in Acts chapter 4, verse 5. Acts 4, verse 5. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? So the high priest and the council are calling the apostles to account. Who gave you the right to come in here and say these things? Who gave you the right to preach in the name of Jesus? Just exactly who do you think you are and where do you get your authority? Now Peter answers in Acts 4 verses 8 to 12 and he tells them it's by the name of Jesus Christ. I am acting under His authority and by His authority. And He is the Lord and only through Him can one be saved. But you keep on going down through the account. Let's pick up in verse 13 to see how the council responds to this. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they threaten them. Verse 18, they called them in, and they commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now let's understand. If you just go back to verse 6, 
you see that this is Annas and Caiaphas. If you remember studying about the trial of the Lord, those two men were prominent leaders in trying Jesus Christ and taking Him over to Pilate and having Pilate put Him to death. This is the same council, the same men, and not very long after they had Jesus put to death. Peter's standing before that council. John is before that council. It is that council that's telling them, don't do it again. Threatening them. And those threats, again, were not empty threats. They meant it. It was not beyond them to have these men in prison and tortured and executed or just to drag them out and stone them to death on the spot. But how does Peter and John respond to this? Verse 19, But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. In other words, it is utter and complete defiance. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you threaten me with. I'm going to speak in the name of Jesus. I'm going to preach Him to the people. He is defiant. They're threatened further. Then it's interesting to me that after they are threatened further, that Peter and John go and meet with the other disciples. They go before God in prayer. And this is what they ask in verse 29. Acts 4 verse 29. Now Lord, look on their threats. And grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. They asked for more boldness. He was just as bold as he could be. And yet he goes and he asks the Lord for more boldness. And this to me illustrates the fact that religious bodies turn against the truth because Annas, Caiaphas, these other high priests, chief priests rather, these Jewish leaders, they are religious men. They are zealous. They are committed. They are moral men as far as they didn't go out and get drunk. They didn't run around. They weren't using filthy language. They were moral, upright men in that sense. But notice how that they have turned against the truth. And they are attacking those who speak the truth and striving to suppress the teaching of God's Word, telling them they have no right to speak these things. And there are religious bodies in our nation that have that exact same position. They have been corrupted and they have turned against the truth. And they have joined in with society at large in suppressing the truth. We need to take a lesson from Peter and John and defy them. When people tell us to stop teaching the truth, we need to stiffen up. No! I'm not giving in to that. I'm going to keep speaking the truth. I'm going to keep telling people what they need to hear. Whether that's in social media or at the workplace, in school, don't be ashamed and don't be intimidated. Peter and John stood strong and firm when that oppression was coming against them. Now the question is, why did Peter change? Why did Peter go from being terrified, denying the Lord three times, to standing before that very council and telling them, I'm going to speak the truth. I'm going to preach Jesus. And what the difference is, the resurrection. When he saw the risen Lord, that convicted him. And that conviction drove that fear out. So he's convicted of the truth and that gave rise to the courage that he had when he's standing before that council. We need to be like that. If we'll go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, we have an admonition from the Apostle here about faith and what faith can do for us. In 1 John chapter 5 verse 4, it says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So how do we build our faith? 
A lot of you know where we're going. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You know, some we, we study these things and let's understand the truth doesn't change. How do we build our faith? Go to the Word of God. Allow that to convict you of the truth. And when you're convicted of the truth, then you have courage. Go to God in prayer, as many of them did. Go to God and seek that wisdom, as James talks about, that you need, that you can deal with these things when that pressure is being brought to bear against you. What do I do? How, how do I respond to this? Build that faith through study and prayer so when the moment comes, you'll stand bold and strong. When we are filled with faith, fear is suppressed. It's minimized. It's manageable. And this doesn't mean that we're blind to the danger or to the consequences. The Bible doesn't tell us just, just be blind to all of that. What it tells us is don't be controlled by it. Do you think Esther was nervous when she got up that morning to get dressed, put on her royal robes, and go down before the king? I mean, maybe you can make the argument she wasn't nervous. She was as cool as a cucumber. I think she was a little nervous. But she got a favorable response and she used that to get another one and another one until she accomplished her task. We recognize consequences. We recognize danger, if you will. But we can't let that control us. We need to have the faith that will push us through that. We need to be known for courage and dedication and resolve. We need to leave a legacy of overcoming fear, of facing danger and pressing forward. A legacy of turning to God and taking action and trusting in Him regardless of those consequences that we face. That's what we want to leave. You look at Hezekiah and Esther and Peter. How do you think of it? We think of them as great heroes of faith. And when our life is lived and we're gone, how do we want others to remember us? I would like to think in the same way. I know that's how I want to be perceived. As one who's faithful and dedicated and committed to God and ready to pay any price. Do I always live up to that? No, I don't. There are times and situations in life that are very intimidating. We don't want to speak up. We don't want the trouble. We don't want the aggravation. We don't want the blowback on us. And so we hold back. We don't speak up. It's not how I want to be known in the end. And Peter gives me hope because Peter, he caved. But then look at what he did with the rest of his life. It tells me I can do that too. And you can do that. You all open to number 830. 830. <laughs> When we have overwhelming fear that controls us, it leads to weakness and confusion and shame and ultimately to condemnation. Because the cowardly will be in the lake of fire. But faith, faith on the other hand, it leads to boldness and courage and honor and ultimately to eternal life. We have that promise from the Lord and we need to hold on to that promise and realize whatever we may face here, whatever the enemy may be, however we may be attacked, whatever we may have to pay and sacrifice, it's going to be worth it. Because He has that great blessing of eternity with Him. So we encourage you. Submit yourself to the Lord and live in the power of faith. 
you're not a child of God, then won't you become one today? Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Turn away from your sins and be baptized to have your sins washed away. That's a consistent message from Jesus, from His apostles. If you will do that, you can be a child of God and you can live in faith. As a child of God, if you've given in to fear, be resolved that you're going to get rid of that out of your life. You're going to fortify your faith. You're going to turn to the Lord for help and strength. And you will ask others to encourage you, to strengthen you, to pray for you. If there's something you need to confess publicly, we invite you to do that. We invite you to do it not to shame you, but for you to make your life right with the Lord, to restore your fellowship with Him, and restore your good standing before the brethren and before others. So if you need to make things right with the Lord this morning, won't you do so? Come forward while we stand and sing.